sorry to interrupt your, uh, I'm sure, enjoyable dinner conversation. Um, moving on to the next part of the evening, I just wanted to briefly introduce Mark Cortez, the man who everyone knows and who is in the background of our discussion earlier today. Um, to keep introduction short, Mark's professor at Wheaton College, uh, written several books on theological anthropology, one of which um, all of you are familiar with and um, were probably too nice about today, having the author in the room with you. Uh, but we are all grateful for his work um, there and other publications, and we're glad to have him with us tonight and tomorrow. Um, please join me in uh, welcoming Mark, who's going to talk on human being and plasticity. All right, thank you. I will admit to being a little intrigued as you were all talking about the book. I did ex actually expect to hear a few more comments about how people may have found the book frustrating in your various discussion groups, because I didn't write it to be read in like local church small group settings and whatnot. Um, so if there are like frustrating thoughts lurking in the background that haven't come out yet, I actually would be interested in hearing those. Uh, I know using them with students at Wheaton, I often get frustrating type comments. So they won't be new to me probably, but I'd be curious to know how people responded to it uh, in a local church setting, even if it was not entirely positive. <clears throat> uh, all right, well, I love after dinner talks, right? We make you travel all morning, we make you talk all afternoon, we feed you a big meal, and then I get to say thanks. <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. Uh, and for the sake of those of you who have read the book, I intentionally decided to talk about something that's not in the book, give us something kind of new to think about and reflect on, um, although it will overlap with some of the comments about transhumanism uh, made earlier today. Um, and uh, I will admit this is going to come across in places as, um, I realized when I finished writing the paper, this is going to feel at times like I'm actually pr presenting a defense of Christian posthumanism. Um, I was kind of surprised by that because that wasn't what I went into it intending to do. Um, so we'll see how that goes. All right. <clears throat> I didn't realize it until relatively late in my theological development, but I grew up with a fundamental ambiguity in my understanding of humanity. Or more specifically, a fundamental ambiguity in my understanding of the extent to which we can know what it means to be human. See, on the one hand, I've been a bit of a sci-fi and fantasy nerd since I was a kid, which means that I grew up with stories that constantly stretched and challenged existing notions of what it means to be human. What if you had a human who was capable not only of taking on the physical forms of other creatures, but even to think and feel like they do, blurring the lines between human and animal? Or what if we played with the idea of a hybrid creature? maybe part human, part bull, skipping over the rather awkward part about exactly how such a creature came to be produced in the first place. Suppose instead that we replaced most of a human person's body parts with technological devices and just uploaded their identity into a supercomputer somewhere. All of these are common motifs in science fiction and fantasy. And each challenges us to consider the possibility that the category of the human might be far more expansive than we had originally imagined. At the same time, though, I grew up in a cultural and theological context in which the idea of the human actually wasn't terribly complicated. In the beginning, God made halibut, hamsters, and humans, each according to their own kind. And Adam didn't seem to have any problem telling them apart. When I'm walking around town, I can pretty easily figure out that I'm a human, and that's a dog. Even when people dress their dogs up with little jackets and hats and those little booties, I can still tell the difference. And no matter how smart my phone gets, it's still a phone. In other words, there was relatively little angst around the question of what a human is. We knew there were messy questions at the beginning and end of human life, but we saw those primarily about identifying when a human life begins and ends, not determining what a human life fundamentally is. So I walked around for years with this weird combination of ideas in my head. On the one hand, my anthropological imagination was full of visions in which the idea of the human was a complex, malleable thing that had to be constantly negotiated in light of new information. <clears throat> 
But on the other hand, my actual understanding of the human was stable and secure. A relatively fixed reality that could provide a reliable point of reference in an otherwise chaotic world. Now, you might be inclined to dismiss all of this as the inevitable clash of the fantasy world created by books and movies with the real world of everyday life. But I'd like us to consider tonight the possibility that a similar tension is at work in the Christian imagination regarding the human person. And unless we identify that tension and begin to think through its implications with greater rigor, I think it's one that has potential to cause all kinds of difficulties as we engage contemporary conversations about what it means to be human, what makes humans distinct from other kinds of creatures, and what kinds of transformations a human can experience, including the intentional modification of the human person through technological means, and still qualify as human. To see what I have in mind, we're going to spend the evening together thinking about the plasticity of the human person, primarily through dialogue with a loosely affiliated group of thinkers commonly referred to as post-humanists. This dialogue will unfold in three point, parts. Dialogue, like you all are saying anything, right? But it's a dialogue anyway. <clears throat> the first part of the paper will introduce us to the meaning of the terms plasticity and post-humanism, seeking to explain what motivates their increasing popularity and how they lead to rather interesting conclusions for the task of defining what it means to be human. In the second part, we will focus on several reasons why, uh, uh, that theologians have given for rejecting this as an adequate way of understanding humanity, and why those, versions seem uh, why those theological positions seem incompatible with these more modern concepts. In other words, here we will see that Christian theology is driven by a set of theological intuitions that seem to require us to reject the idea that humans are malleable to the extent required by the language of plasticity and posthumanism. The third part of the paper, though, will explore a different set of theological intuitions. Those that raise significant questions about these traditional ways of defining what it means to be human, and that might require us to modify at least some of the negative evaluations offered by the theological critics of posthumanism. And finally, we will wrap things up with a few thoughts about the implications this all has for thinking about what it means to flourish as human persons today. In other words, I think there's every possibility that a paper like this will raise far more questions than it answers, but hopefully that will lead to some good after-dinner discussion. So first, plasticity and posthumanism. People use our first term, plasticity, in a variety of contexts to denote the idea that some material object is sufficiently malleable to undergo at least certain kinds of changes while remaining in at least some ways a member of that same class of objects that it was prior to the change. So for example, when I was a kid, we often liked to entertain ourselves with a small pile of those little green army men and a lighter. <laughs> now I'm not sure who thought it was a good idea to let us have a lighter, but with the application of a little heat, you could stretch and mold those little guys in all kinds of interesting ways stretching, squishing, and bending them however you'd like. When you're done, you could still tell they were army men, but they've been remarkably transformed to look like something out of a militarized Dr. Seuss book. That's an example of plasticity, made rather obvious by the fact that these little guys are, in fact, made out of plastic. On some occasions, however, we would get particularly bored and simply melt one of those little guys down to a puddle of green goo. Although this still involves the malleability of a given object, it seems more reasonable to envision this as an instance of the destruction rather than the transformation of the entity in question. And of course, that immediately introduces us to the rather tricky task of delineating between destruction and transformation, a challenge that will probably stay with us all evening. Now, although the term has been around for quite some time, particularly in physics and biology, Plasticity seems to have begun affecting conversations in anthropology, most notably through the concept of neuroplasticity. In other words, the idea that human brains are shaped and molded throughout a person's life by their environments and experiences. Rather than being clearly hardwired from the beginning, our brains are remarkably malleable, capable of undergoing significant changes in proportion, functionality, and connectivity. Given the importance of the brain for modern ways of thinking about what it means to be human, it should come as no surprise that an emphasis on the plasticity of the brain has had rather direct implications for emphasizing the plasticity of the human person. 
contributing, as I think we all know, to the widespread notion that certain things that we used to view as unchangeable features of a person's biological reality, things like sex, gender, and now even race, are increasingly viewed through the lens of plasticity, and thus as features that can and should be molded throughout an individual's life. Our second term, posthumanism, is rather more difficult to define. And it might help if we begin with the related term that we ran into earlier today, transhumanism. Transhumanism is commonly defined as a class of philosophies that seek the continuation and acceleration of the evolution of intelligent life beyond its currently human form and human limitations by means of science and technology guided by life-promoting principles and values. That's the definition, by the way, from the H Plus website that's dedicated to transhumanism. <clears throat> Moving from rather innocuous examples of technological enhancement like LASIK surgery, artificial limbs, and pacemakers, to more thoroughgoing transformations like modifying the human genome or thought experiments about uploading the human consciousness to a supercomputer, transhumanist thinkers all appeal to the plasticity of the human person, indeed of the human species, to maintain that such transformations are simply another expression of our essential malleability. If we can change, and if we inevitably will change, it seems reasonable to think that we should seek to be active participants in that change so that we can direct our future toward reasonable and beneficial ends. Transhumanism is thus an inherently future-oriented and developmental mode of thinking about humanity that focuses on ways in which humans might now be able to act so as to guide the evolution of humanity towards something that lies beyond what we currently think of as being human. If transhumanism thus focuses more on the process of moving toward this transcendent future, posthumanism tends to focus more on the result. If we accept the transhumanist vision, it becomes necessary to talk at times about, from the same website, possible future beings whose basic capacities so radically exceed those of present humans as to be no longer unambiguously human by our current standards. Consequently, it's possible to understand these two terms as two sides of the same coin, one focused on the process involved and often the technologies required, and the latter focusing primarily on the new posthumanist state itself. However, many posthumanist thinkers offer a sharper distinction between the two ideas, focusing largely on the extent to which someone continues to affirm the basic tenets of humanism, in which the human person remains distinct from non-human entities and retains a privileged position in our endeavors to understand the universe. Transhumanism, on this perspective, is generally viewed as retaining this humanist impulse, seeking to expand our understanding of the human rather than to jettison it entirely. Though we, we, uh, many posthumanists, on the other hand, reject this humanistic ethos, intentionally seeking to break down existing barriers between the human and the non-human. To a large degree, then, posthumanists and transhumanists dif differ on the extent to which the future transformation of humanity is such that we can, can continue to talk about human as a discrete and distinguishable class of objects in the world, or whether it is merely the language we currently use to describe the state of existence in which we now find ourselves. Regardless, though, the basic impulse behind both transhumanism and posthumanism is the plasticity of humanity. Pushing beyond the rather modest claims of neuroplasticity, proponents of these views maintain that humans can, should, and maybe even unavoidably will utilize existing and future technologies in ways that will challenge the limitations of humanity, limitations that include things like death, the body, space, and time, reshaping humanity into entirely new forms such that uh, they may lead either to new conceptions of what it means to be human or to a new post-human state entirely. Double-sided papers are terrible. Part two, <clears throat> post-humanists are heretics besides being just wrong. With this basic summary in place, it shouldn't take long to appreciate three key worries often identified by Christian theologians. There are other issues we could pursue, most notably those that involve the ethical, socio-political, or environmental implications of posthumanism, 
But I want to restrict our focus to three specifically theological issues. And I want you to note, I just skipped over some really big, huge questions that if we were gonna do a thoroughgoing discussion of posthumanism, we wouldn't be able to skip over the ethical, socio-political, and environmental implications. So don't take that as a, I don't think those are big deals. They are, but this is one paper. So put those over there for now. <clears throat> Almost certainly the most common of these theological worries is that posthumanism entails a form of Gnosticism. Ignoring for a moment the fact that Gnosticism itself is a rather malleable term, theologians often apply the term to any system that seeks to denigrate the essential goodness of the material world as the work of God the Creator. So it's not hard to see why people might worry that posthumanism entails some form of Gnosticism. In its call to transcend the limitations of the human condition, Posthumanism calls into question the goodness of the material order, suggesting that we should strive to transcend such fundamental limitations as time and space. For many posthumanists, overcoming the temporal limitations provided by aging and death constitutes the fundamental goal of the posthumanist agenda. And given that many posthumanists focus on the mind as the locus of human, locus of human identity, Thus exploring the possibility of continuing human existence completely apart from the body, those are the upload scenarios. The posthumanist vision allows the possibility of transcending spatial limitations as well. Indeed, many see posthumanism as challenging human finitude itself, setting absolutely no limits on that which should be viewed as achievable in humanity's future. One off-sided statement thus declares, quote, people of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your biological chains. It is difficult to hear such a vision as involving anything less than a clear challenge to the Christian commitment to the goodness and givenness of the created order. Indeed, many of the posthumanist claims seem to be precisely the kinds of ideas the church encountered and explicitly rejected when developing the core aspects of its doctrine of creation in the patristic period. Rather than viewing the body as an obstacle to be removed and transcended in the pursuit of some higher state, these early theologians maintain the importance of affirming that the material order, along with the given limitations of space and time and the necessarily finite nature of creaturely existence, should all be viewed as good aspects of God's creational purposes, powerly, powerfully affirmed by the incarnation of God himself and eternally established in the doctrines of the resurrection and the materiality of the new creation. Michael Heim thus warns that the posthumanist vision of the future could easily become, quote, a Gnostic and Manichaean inferno whose inhabitants loathe the very existential features that anchor humans to the real world. And Brent Waters speaks for many when he eschews the posthumanist vision as, quote, a Gnostic escape or liberation from material constraints and a high-tech Manichaean fantasy. The second worry is that the posthumanist vision inherently entails some form of Pelagianism. To see why, we first need to appreciate the parallels between the posthumanist vision of the future and the Christian doctrine of salvation. Many of the things identified as being overcome in the posthumanist vision of the future are the very same things that Christians have long associated as being among the blessings of the eschatological state. No sickness, no death, unlimited time, and more. Consequently, many note that despite the clearly atheistic posture of posthumanism and most of its advocates, the movement shares many parallels with religious traditions. However, if the posthumanist vision, if the posthumanist envisions a future that has clear parallels with the Christian doctrine of salvation, it also contends that this future is something we can and should produce through our own, often technological, efforts. In other words, it seems that Christ humans can bring about the eschatological state through their own efforts, unaided by any special work of divine grace. To Christian ears, that sounds unavoidably similar to, quote, the Pelagian conceit of an ability to perfect or transform ourselves. Such a self-salvation project seems necessarily at odds with the Christian conviction that grace comes by God's special, salvation comes by God's special grace alone. Unlike the first two, the third worry does not come with a handy heretical label. Yet we will see that it still carries with it some important Christian convictions. The concern here is that posthumanism stretches the definition of the human to such an extent that it becomes impossible to define what it even means to be human. Let's call this the definition worry 
We've already noted in our summary of posthumanism that it, it, that it envisions a future in which humanity has moved beyond its currently human form and human limitations, such that we arrive at a state that is no longer unambiguously human by our current standards. Although this could be interpreted as making a statement only about our knowledge of humanity in the future, many rightly point out that such a claim has epistemological implications for what we think it means to be human now. At the very least, if it is possible for current humans to develop into something that completely transcends our current conceptions uh, for what we think it means to be human, <clears throat> then we at least have to revise our understanding of current humanity to include the idea that it's capable of that kind of a transformation. More fundamentally, if it's possible for such a transformed kind of humanity to qualify as human in any meaningful sense of the term, as many transhumanists maintain, then even the limitations that we place on our current conceptions of humanity will need to be removed. As Sweat Bates points out then, this is an extended quotation, the concept of the post-human also functions as a way of critically interrogating the concept of human nature itself. Is there any th such thing as human nature? And if so, is it the kind of universal, essential, inherent, and immutable quality it has previously been assumed to be? This investigation into what it means to be human thus morphs into the question of what counts as human and therefore post-human. The first is an investigation into a given, asking questions about what it means to inhabit the ontological category of human. The second presumes that the category itself, the boundaries that define it, is constructed, and therefore a matter requiring, requiring conscious and conscientious deliberation. So consequently, posthumanism presents a challenge to the very idea that there is such a thing as the human that can be readily distinguished from some category called the non-human. As I mentioned earlier, at least some transhumanists resist, resist such a move, maintaining a commitment to the humanistic intuition that humans are distinguishable entities that can and should be privileged in some way as we attempt to understand the universe. Yet they, the rhetoric they use to describe the transcendent future state of humanity um, We've already seen that the rhetoric they use to describe the future transcendent state of humanity, such that the term human may describe more of a historical reality. In other words, the way transhumanists use the word human seems to describe it more as a species that stands in some kind of narratival or historical relationship to this the species we currently think of as human, rather than as any kind of ontologically or biologically real species. Humanity turns into, on the transhumanist vision, it's a bit more of a story than an ontologically real thing. The definitional worry also seems to press against some rather fundamental Christian intuitions. Most obviously, as noted above, the creation account itself seems to suggest that humanity is a real thing that can be differentiated from non-human aspects of creation. Regardless of how you understand the meaning of the Imago Dei, it seems important to the creation narratives that only humans are Imago Dei creatures, suggesting that they are differentiable in at least some way and if humanity is not a discrete and identifiable reality, how can we make sense of the claim that the eternal son became human in the incarnation? When the author of Hebrews claims that the son became fully like us in every way, does he mean only that he took on the characteristics we happened to have at that point of the story? Or does he have in mind something more like what Christians have traditionally assumed? That human is a term that picks out an ontologically real and distinct entity with which the Son has now inseparably joined himself. And although the Christian narrative of salvation certainly maintains a prominent place for the redemption of creation as a whole, does it not also emphasize the unique significance of human persons in that narrative? Yet that seems fundamentally at odds with the post-humanist blurring of the lines between the human and the non-human. For many Christian theologians then, even if post-humanism might still be valuable for probing deeply on a number of important topics, we must ultimately view it as a destructive philosophical approach, one that is simply incompatible with basic Christian intuitions about the world and the place of the human person in it, and one that inevitably presses toward various heretical and non-Christian conclusions. On a part three, a different set of theological intuitions. In light of the preceding worries, it might seem like we should simply stop our theological conversation with post-humanism here. <laughs> 
However, an increasing number of modern theologians seem inclined to think not only that we should embrace this emphasis on the plasticity of the human person, but that at least some aspects of the Christian tradition actually support this kind of anthropological vision. For example, drawing on the idea that human persons were created to image an infinite, boundless, and free God, destined for eschatological transformation through deification, Catherine Tanner emphasizes, quote, the plastic, shape-shifting character of human nature, such that we have, quote, a nature that imitates God only, only by not having, one might say, a clearly delimited nature. So we are an incomprehensible image of the incomprehensible. Thomas Carlson argues for an even more strongly apophatic vision of humanity, utilizing the medieval theologian Nicholas of Cusa to maintain that the human is an indefinite creature who proves, quote, endlessly plastic, innovative, and endowed with potential, thanks precisely to its lack of a fixed nature, essential definition, or lawful program. Without necessarily endorsing this, uh, entirely this apophatic vision of humanity, I think if we probe a bit more deeply into the three worries raised above, we can see that such worries may not have identified all of the theological intuitions that Christians can and should bring to bear on these matters. First, the Gnostic worry. Now, don't get me wrong. I have no intention of arguing that there is some set of Christian intuitions that will help us realize that Gnosticism is not that bad after all. Not only do I remain firmly convinced that we need to resist Gnostic ways of thinking whenever we find them, but Gnosticism also has such a bad reputation in theological circles today that offering a defense of Gnosticism would be a bit like trying to argue that we should be okay with the good kind of child sacrifice. So my point here isn't to rehabilitate Gnosticism, but to point out that Christians may have at least some reasons for interpreting the posthumanist arguments in ways that would not lead to the conclusion that posthumanism inevitably results in Gnostic conclusions. Now, as I noted above, the Gnostic worry stems from the posthumanist vision that the future of humanity lies in overcoming the limitations of the natural order, the material order. However, it is worth reminding ourselves that much of the Christian imagination regarding the future state of humanity also involves overcoming material limitations in surprisingly similar ways. An obvious example of this com comes from Gregory of Nyssa's understanding of the epistatic stretching of human nature in the resurrection as it takes on and participates in the attributes of the divine nature to whatever extent is humanly possible. While Nyssa clearly affirms the reality that we will have a resurrected body, he allows his notion of what qualifies as a body to be challenged by his eschatological vision of union with God and one another to such an extent that it is no longer entirely clear what he means by having a body. In other words, even while affirming the goodness of the created order, Nyssa points out that Christians often imagine the eschaton in ways that challenge existing notions of the human and the limitations necessary for something to continue qualifying as human. This is true even for those whose views of the resurrected body might not be as dramatic as Nyssa's. Just consider the ways that we often talk about the post-resurrection body of Jesus. Many Christians seem to have no problem affirming that his body was suddenly capable of moving through locked doors and taking on different forms of outward appearance. Although these might seem like relatively minor transformations, far short of anything that would qualify as a complete revisioning of human nature, that may simply be because we have not adequately considered the implications involved in saying that Jesus' physical body was suddenly able to morph at will and pass through other material objects. Those are things we most often attribute to ghosts and other non-material objects, not merely a heightened form of a body that remains essentially physical. And of course, nearly all Christian visions of eternal life involve humans transcending the temporal limitations, so often viewed as inherent to the material order as we live forever with God in Christ. Yet we think we can imagine all of this, without casting aspersions on the goodness of the material order itself. Instead, we seem quite capable of imagining a future world that is every bit as open to transformation as that offered by the posthumanists, while still rejecting the idea that such transformation requires us to think negatively about creation. To ground the Gnostic worry more firmly, then, we would need to establish that unlike the Christian vision of the transformed future, <laughs> 
The post-humanist vision is inherently rooted in a suspicion of, or even denigration of, the created order. Some critics thus suggest that the post-humanist vision stems from a secret, though occasionally stated, hatred of the body and its limitations. However, although that might be the case for particular post-humanists, and I've got a footnote here that I'm differentiating throughout this on kind of post-humanism as kind of a general abstract category and particular post-humanists. So you may think there's a particular post-humanist who hates the body. That's entirely possible. I'm talking more about whether the post-humanist kind of framework requires that kind of suspicion. <clears throat> uh, so it would be difficult to make that case for post-humanism as a whole. Rather than starting their arguments from the presupposition that the body is inherently bad, most post-humanists begin instead by casting a vision for things that seem intrinsically good, for example, health and longevity. When they go on to posit a future that is separate from the human body, this is only because the body seems to them to be inextricably bound up with the very problems they think need to be overcome. As, a material, uh, as material entities, bodies inevitably age and die. Therefore, if those are problems we should seek to address, we will need to fix the body problem. In other words, their vision of the future flows not from a hatred of the body, but from a commitment to a number of important goods, along with the conviction that the body, at least in its current state, prevents access to those goods. Yet this seems rather similar to the Christian conviction that although the body is a part of God's good creation, it also needs to be transformed in some way so that it can participate in the eschatological life to come. That's Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. For the second worry, I think we can follow a similar pattern and argue not that Pelagius was actually right, especially not if this is being recorded, but that our own theological traditions carry with them resources for interpreting posthumanism in ways that are decidedly less Pelagian. Now remember that the Pelagian worry arises because posthumanism envisions a future hope of salvation that is brought about by human effort. Yet we need to keep in mind here, which will be difficult for you to do since you're not looking at the paper, I put salvation in scare quotes. Yet we need to keep in mind here that the scare quotes around salvation are there to signal the fact that even the loftiest post-human vision of the future does not actually qualify as salvation in any meaningfully Christian sense of the term. Although it includes elements that are typically associated with salvation, things like unending life, it does not address things like a right relationship with God, union with Christ and the body of Christ through the Spirit, and other elements necessary for their vision of the future to qualify as salvation in a Christian sense of the term. From at least one perspective, then, posthumanism cannot qualify as Pelagian because it isn't actually talking about salvation. More importantly, posthumanists aren't alone in thinking that at least some elements of humanity's eschatological future can be viewed as the direct outworking of human efforts now. Indeed, that seems an apt way of describing at least some kinds of post-millennial theologies. In other words, theological systems in which Christian efforts are directly re involved in realizing the kingdom of God. At their best, such systems hardly qualify as Pelagian for two reasons. First, they too recognize that not even their best efforts can produce salvation. Second, since they emphasize that the kingdom comes through the work of the church, they do not think that even the kingdom is produced through human effort alone. Yet there's nothing about post-humanism that prevents them from saying precisely the same thing, despite, of course, the fact that their atheism would prevent them from doing so. So additionally, one of the primary functions of eschatology historically, beyond providing an opportunity to debate about whether the locusts in heaven are actually Black Hawk helicopters, has been the conviction that what we believe about the future matters for how we live today. In other words, even if we believed that every aspect of the future kingdom would only come as a pure gift of God's grace and not as a result of any human effort now, such a perspective would still maintain that we should live now in light of the reality that will be ours in the eschaton. If that is the case, and if that vision includes things like the ending of suffering, pain, sickness, and death, why wouldn't we seek to harness existing technologies in such a way as to minimize those things to whatever extent humanly possible? To motivate this worry sufficiently, then, it must be not only that posthumanism exhorts people to pursue transformational activities now on the basis of a salvation that will come later, nor can it be only that they think their current efforts may have some consequence for realizing those future efforts. 
Instead, it seems likely that the real worry is that at least some post-humanists post think we can achieve eternal life through these endeavors. And since eternal life seems to be intrinsic to the Christian view of salvation, and not something that should be viewed in any way as a product of human effort, posthumanism seems to contain at least one element that is inherently Pelagian. Yet here as well, I think we can simply repeat what we said above about the posthumanist view, view of salvation. Whatever is meant by eternal life in this context is a far cry from what the phrase means in Christian theology. According to upload scenarios, this eternal life results from transferring the human mind from the finite and unre unreliable human body to some kind of technological medium that would allow the mind to exist indefinitely. But notice that no matter how advanced it might be, this technological medium would still be creaturely, finite, and subject to at least some kinds of breakdown, as experienced by anyone who has used such technology recently. Even, the existence of, um, in even an existence of indefinite duration seems radically different from the secure and eternal life promised by Scripture. A more viable target for the Pelagian worry would be those post-humanists who infirm instead some kind of radical transformation of human nature itself so that we become capable of transcending death on our own. So we could either limit the Pelagian worry to the, this flavor of post-humanism alone, or we could attempt to rehabilitate even this version, presumably by questioning whether even this kind of life qualifies as what a Christian eschatology has in mind when it talks about eternal life. Some of the intuitions we've mentioned above already suggest that posthumanists aren't all the only ones who struggle with our third worry, the definitional worry. Indeed, on Nissa's account of the resurrection, I'm not entirely clear how to define what it means to be human, other than to say that humans are the kinds of creatures who can undergo that kind of transformation. However, I think we can add a couple of additional intuitions to strengthen the idea that this worry flows more directly from various Christian convictions than we might originally think. For many theologians, the Imago Dei itself points to the inherent mysteriousness of the human person. Just as God is transcendent and mysterious in his own divine nature, so the creatures created in his image likewise exhibit an inherent indefinability. For other theologians, it's the idea that the human is a person, which suggests a kind of freedom from the limitations of nature, emphasizing that transcendence and plasticity are inherent to human existence. We may even be able to find indications of something similar in unexpected places. For example, Thomas Aquinas would typically be viewed as someone who views a human nature as something identifiably discrete, defining the human nature with a high degree of confidence on the basis of the unique set of properties that only a human nature instantiates. However, things get a little trickier when we ask Aquinas to describe not only those properties that human natures have instantiated, but also all of the properties that a human nature can instantiate. For example, if we went back before the time of Jesus, it seems reasonable to think that no one would have thought that human natures were able to instantiate the property of being able to walk on water. Then Jesus comes along and demonstrates that this is in fact a property that can be realized in a human nature, raising the question of whether human nature might be capable of far more than we think. Now, one might respond to this by pointing out that many Thomists make a distinction between the rather generic idea that God can work all kinds of miraculous transformations in creaturely entities, for example, making a rock sing, as long as they don't entail an actual contradiction of that entity's nature, for example, trying to make a square circle. Um, so the idea that God can do things like make a rock sing is often described in Thomist circles as a general obediential potency. If you're not into Thomistic jargon, just ask Joel later what that means, and he'll get us all straightened out. Um, so the general obediential potency of creature and the kinds of transformations that should be viewed as gracious perfections of a creature's nature are often described as specific obediential potency. So general obediential potency would be God makes the rock sing. Rocks have no capacities that are singing kinds of capacities. So that's like a complete miraculous kind of thing. Um, uh, God suddenly making me able to run a four-minute mile, that would be a miracle, but certainly seems to be consistent with the kinds of capacities that I have. So a specific obediential potency is the transformation of an existing set of potencies, uh, general 
obediential potency is the God can do weird things because he's God. Such a distinction would allow someone to maintain that a miraculous transformation alone does not require us to redefine the creature's nature, so long as the transformation is only an expression of the general obediential potency of all creaturely realities. It would only be those uh, transformations that are expressions of a creature's specific obediential potency that might require us to reconsider how we defined a particular nature. So for example, if God miraculously made some human person capable of teleporting from one place to another, I might contend that this is an example of general obediential potency, choosing not to revise my understanding of human nature such that it was less spatially restricted than I had previously thought. But if God gifts humans with beatific vision, and if I interpret that as an example of humanity's specific obediential potency, I now have reasons for revising my understanding of human nature such that I view it as capable of receiving the, a kind of knowledge I would not have previously thought possible. As important as this distinction might be in Thomas circles, though, it's not entirely clear how it will help with our definitional worry. Even the idea of a specific obediential potency fails to provide many clear resources for determining the kinds of transformations a nature can achieve or receive prior to them actually achieving or receiving them. At best, it requires that we, we maintain that such eventual transformation will be in accord with the natural capacities of the human nature. But it's not obvious to me why a post-humanist wouldn't say precisely the same thing. They don't envision the future transformation as somehow being in opposition to our current potentialities. Indeed, they have no other basis for our future transformation than our current potentialities. Like Aquinas' system, they allow for the possibility that future transformations might require us, though, to reassess what is already a part of our current set of potentialities. Part four, some thoughts on human flourishing. Based on the argument above, it seems to be the case that certain rather significant Christian intuitions produce conclusions that are notably similar to post-humanist positions that some theologians see as leading inevitably to three fatal problems, Gnosticism, Pelagianism, and the inability to define humanity. We thus seem to face one of four possible conclusions. Possible conclusion number one, I'm wrong. Number two, these conclusions do in fact lead to these consequences, and we should conclude that there's nothing wrong with these consequences. Option three, these conclusions do in fact lead to these consequences, and we therefore need to reject or significantly revise the corresponding Christian intuitions. Option four, these conclusions do not in fact lead to these consequences, and we should therefore allow such transformative notions of humanity's future to lead us to revise our understanding of human nature and at least be open to the correspondingly transformative practices. Keeping in mind here that we still need to entertain the ethical, socio-political, and environmental concerns I skipped earlier. So, four options, right? I'm wrong. Um, these conclusions do follow, and we should embrace the conclusions. The conclusions do follow, and we should re reject the intuitions. Or four, just go with it. The first option is clearly absurd. If you want to explore the second option and the possibility that Gnosticism and Pelagianism are viable theological positions, I will let you do that on your own time. So we can set aside the second option as well. Since I'm a Baptist and can therefore safely ignore pretty much all the other Christian traditions, I suppose the third one should technically be an option for me. But I'm not generally inclined toward trying to explain why most Christians have gotten their theology wrong. And it seems like most of those Christian intuitions that we have discussed are pretty central aspects of Christian theology. So I'm going to pass on the third option as well. That makes it seem as though the fourth option is our likeliest candidate moving forward. But before we conclude, we need to note that the fourth option comes with a price, probably more than one. Traditionally, our discourse about what it means to flourish as human persons has presumed some articulable idea of what it means to be human. In more Aristotelian terms, an entity flourishes insofar as it uh, actualizes its potentialities and moves toward its proper end. Thus, to facilitate the flourishing of any particular entity, you need to know something of its nature, which includes knowing both its potentialities and its end. Lacking such knowledge, you would have no real way of knowing 
what would qualify as leading to the flourishing or lack of flourishing for that creature. This is precisely why many theologians find the combination of the three worries raised above so problematic. When combined, they suggest both that we have no real idea what it means to be human, either now or in the future, and that we should utilize existing resources to facilitate humanity's progress toward that future. Without the former, though, it's not clear how we can have any real sense of what would qualify as a responsible exercise of the latter. This critique arises most clearly with the posthumanist vision of humanity, as that vision involves humanity overcoming those limitations that prevent us from achieving the desired goods. Indeed, some would suggest that this idea is so central, sorry, that the, this idea is so central to the posthumanist vision that transcending limitations just is their definition of what it means to be human. It is not clear how something like that could function as any kind of guide for human flourishing. If all limitations need to be overcome, then virtually anything should be allowed. Even suggesting that there are bad ways of pursuing a particular end would itself seem to comprise a limitation that would need to be overcome. However, any attempt to make claims about which limitations should or shouldn't be overcome, or which mechanisms should or shouldn't be used in the overcoming process, would seem to require some additional criterion, something beyond merely the call to transcend limitations, by which we could make such a distinction. Lacking that, the worry is that despite the posthumanists' avowed intention to work toward the flourishing of humanity, or whatever we end up calling this posthuman thing, their position ultimately undermines the very notion of flourishing itself. If this is the case, and if we end up concluding that there are Christian intuitions that have more in common with the posthumanist vision of humanity than we might have thought, it would seem reasonable to ask whether we end up with a flourishing problem. And indeed, I think we might if we try to approach the question in the way we have traditionally done. That is grounding our discussion of human flourishing in the idea of a defined human nature with a delineable set of discrete potentialities and a sufficiently clear telos. In other words, unless we modify some aspect of the argument above, it will be difficult to make satisfying arguments that look something like, we know that we should not do A because human nature is X, and A does not contribute to X. Instead, assuming that we want to continue making claims about what leads to human flourishing, which seems like a really good idea, we will need to find a different way of grounding those claims. Now, we could, of course, ground our flourishing claims directly in Scripture. Presumably, God wants his human creatures to flourish. So we can at least begin with whatever information we've got in the Bible. So if the Bible says A leads to human flourishing, we can reasonably conclude that A is a good idea. The problem, of course, and this was referred to earlier today, actually, is that such an argument fails to address the very malleability of human nature that the post-humanist discussion seeks to highlight. Even if we suppose that human nature has been relatively stable up to this point, a claim that would need its own discussion, the potential of uh, future transformation would render problematic any simple appeal to normative claims about human flourishing in the past. At the very least, we would need to do some work to establish ways of discerning when the biblical texts are making claims that were clearly intended to be true of human nature at every stage in its development, or when those claims might be more developmentally limited. This would seem rather similar to the challenge of establishing the significance of cultural context for discussing biblical norms, though on a slightly different register. A similar problem would arise with at least certain kinds of appeals to Jesus as a way of grounding claims about human flourishing. Now, you may or may not be aware of this, but I like Jesus. And I think it's probably a good idea for him to be central to any discussion of humanity or human flourishing. Yet the developmental challenge applies here as well, given that one, the incarnation comes at a discrete point in the process, and two, we have relatively little information about specific details of Jesus' resurrected humanity. The second point becomes even more challenging if we imagine with Nyssa that the resurrection involves an eternal process of ongoing transformation. If so, then any picture we do have of Jesus' resurrected humanity would itself be a particular stage in the transformational process. Fortunately, though, we are not bereft of information, nor are we restricted to making rather abstract claims about merely transcending limitations as the definition of what it means to be human. Instead, we have an entire history of God working with humanity 
One that begins with a creational story that sends clear messages about the kinds of things he has in mind. One that continues through the entire narrative of God working in and through Israel. One that climaxes in Jesus, continues through the church, and gestures, albeit tentatively, toward our final state. Such a history provides resources for understanding where the story is going and what constitutes fitting participation in it. Discussions about human flourishing that proceed on this basis will rarely, if ever, be as straightforward as those grounded in clear definitions of human nature. Instead, they will look a whole lot more like, given the whole story of what God has been doing with humanity as preeminently revealed in Christ, it sure seems like A is a more fitting way of participating in that story at this point in the story than B. To some ears, that sounds overly tenuous and potentially subjective. Yet those who have been involved in Christian ethics know that many have argued that this is precisely how Christians should make moral decisions in general. So maybe it's time for us to apply a similar form of reasoning to decisions we make about what it means to be human and how we flourish as human persons. At least according to the tentative argument presented here, that seems to be the case if we were going to talk about what it means to be human in an age of plasticity. Okay.